Okay, I am Claire Polino, and this is the session Hashtags to Hash Browns. <coughs> Thank you for coming. Um, briefly, very briefly about myself, I've taught here at the Drexel Culinary Program. Some of you may have been in the other session that I did um, for almost 15 years, and I love it here, and I'm so proud of this day to see it finally come together with the community of chefs in the region coming into the school and having everybody learn from each other. Um, my company is a PR and marketing specialty, but in that everything has just turned upside down in the world as we know it in the past, say, three years even, um, to include social media and website development that's moving at a faster pace than it ever did and different things that need to be included in websites. And then you get to the photography aspect of it all, and that's changing as well. Um, so I have really the top experts in the industry today here to talk about it. Um, I have a ton of questions for them, but I'm afraid we're not going to get through all of it. So what I thought we would do is I would have each one of them introduce themselves and tell you a little bit about what they're doing that's just so cutting edge. If need be, I can come back with the questions that I've prepared for them, and then if not, you can also chime in. So we'll kind of do it together if that works for you. Okay, so with that, actually, we're going to go in this order, though. Joe, Mary, Jason. Sure. Because we think that's the way they fit in together best, <laughs> if that's possible. So I'll give you the floor, Joe. So my name is Joe Rinaldi. I work at a web design company called Happy Cog. Um, we're right over on 13th and Walnut. Um, we've worked with Zappos.com. We've worked with Harvard. We've worked with Nintendo. We've worked with a lot of um, clients actually outside the Philadelphia area. That's really where we focus is on kind of global um, website redesigns. Um, but easily the most gratifying project we've worked on in the past year was the beginning of the redesign of all the Garces um, group websites. So we started with Distrito and moved on to Amada, and then we basically built a design system that they could roll out to all of their restaurants themselves, um, all based on responsive design. So um, really that's, that's the biggest point that I want to make today is the value of designing your website responsively. Responsive design just briefly means that rather than try to diagnose all the different devices that are going to use your website, there's code that detects the size of the piece of glass and just recomposes your website based on the, the size of the screen. So if Apple comes out with a perfectly square tablet next year that takes off like wildfire, responsive design will still detect the dimensions of that screen and reformat the website to make sense of the real estate presented to it. So it's a great way to future-proof proof your website. Um, it allows you to change code one time and see all the changes through all your web experiences. So I, I'm a big proponent of the value of your digital um, slash web experience in a restaurant environment. It's the, the first impression a lot of folks have. Um, I'll talk more maybe about how we approach this and the way that we kind of tackled this. But uh, yeah, that's kind of why I'm here today, I think. All right. Hey, everybody. My name is Mary Bigham, and I am the owner of a company called The Town Dish. And it started as a food blog that turned into an online publication for the greater Philadelphia area. Um, we've created a second division in the last two years called Dishworks, where we have um, provided the content management, which includes anything from blog creation and writing to the social media management and expectations for um, a variety of clients including uh, Open Table, Southwest Airlines, um, the Garces Group, Iron Hill Brewery and Restaurant. So those are a few of the people that we do the content management end of things, which is what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, and really, uh, what's I'm curious, based on everyone in the room, if I could see a show of hands, who here is uh, a chef or in the restaurant industry? And then who's a student or someone looking to get into the industry? Okay, in marketing? Okay. All right. I just didn't know who I like. What points to? <laughs> you're like I'm kind of both. Um, so I think the big thing with social media for uh, the variety of different clients and um, for people who are, who are looking to get a better handle on social media is really just figuring out why you're doing social media so that you can determine how to best execute it. So um, some people want to do social media to look really cool and showcase what they're doing that's different from some of their competitors. Um, other people want to do social media so that they can drive people home, which would be whatever you define that to be, whether you want reservations, butts in seats <laughs> um, mm -hmm. to eat, or um, drive traffic to your website. So it really de depends on what, what your reasoning to do social media is. Um, and then really the execution of that. So what we found is that um, 
through a great online presence, through interactive websites and call to actions to then interact and engage through social media, then using those platforms to best uh, serve your purpose in doing it. So that can be creating excellent content, compelling content to have people keep a, a reason for them to keep coming back to your website, give them a reason to other than just to make a reservation because every restaurant wants you to make a reservation. So why are they coming to your website to then engage and maybe take that next step of coming in? Um, and then uh, also the execution. I equate social media to owning a pet. Um, if you <laughs> want to do all of them, it's like getting a puppy, for like five puppies, if you want to do Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and Pinterest. You have to be able to put the resources into taking care of that puppy. They're cute and they'll make you look cool. Uh, you'll probably pick up chicks if you, you know, take your take your puppy for a walk. But um, you have to make sure that you, you give it the resources it needs to, to be successful. Um, so really measuring those expectations. We all have seen Twitter accounts or Facebook pages that have started um, really enthusiastically and then they die, die off. And w do we judge those accounts that aren't babysat? Raise your hand if you judge an account like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you don't want to be that person. <laughs> um, so that's one way that we, <laughs> did you judge? Are you judging? Um, great, we have a, a judgmental panel. Um, so one thing that we've been able to do is help uh, our different clients in keeping that engagement alive. Um, so uh, people, unless you're willing to commit to doing that social media on your own, uh, there are a lot of chefs, uh, Morimoto, uh, is a great example. He's he's someone who religiously posts and has a huge following and people want to hear from him. It doesn't matter if there's typos or or it's like weirdly personal or, or whatever. It's coming from him so there's that like star connection. Um, if you're going to use a, a resource like uh, Dishworks, my company, um, you have to measure those expectations. You're using a, a third party you know to execute and take care of your puppy. Um, so there's different uh, different things that w we use to engage with the, the people on the other end of social media. So it's not going to be the star power. We're not getting pictures of inside the chef's kitchen because the chef isn't the one doing it. Um, so two different things. Why are you doing social media? Expectations. Measure them realistically and then execution. Come up with a game plan. If you can't do it yourself, be realistic and then hire someone who can. Jason. Hey, I'm Jason Varney and I'm a food and restaurant photographer. Um, I was a Drexel grad and I came out of school with a fashion and uh, portrait portfolio and wasn't getting anywhere with it and I started to uh, shoot some restaurants. Um, it was something I really gravitated to and uh, submitted some work to some of the local magazines like Philly Mag and Philly Style New Jersey Monthly and they all responded immediately with assignments when I wasn't getting that sort of fashion and portrait work and I really grew to, to love uh, shooting restaurants and it started out that you know I was shooting for these smaller magazines and then the restaurants started hiring me and uh, now it's a lot of big national magazines and it's grown to cookbooks. Um, what I hope to, uh, to help out with is you know the idea that you can be in control of your brand and by uh, photography especially, you know, people eat with their eyes first. And for you to be able to control the dishes you want to show, show viewers and put on your website and use in, in marketing and media, you're able to create, you know, some buzz for yourself if you're doing something really special or um, utilize uh, being able to put images out towards um, bigger national stories like if you know, GQ is doing a roundup on best places to drink beer in America. If, if you know, someone like Alaspina has a killer beer shot, they're going to get better placement, and that's happened. Um, you know, uh, it was a situation where I I I'd shoot and shot in uh, Alaspina's uh, beer menu, and they ran two full page shots um, back to back in, in GQ, and and stuff like that happens all the time. Um, it's, you know, it's, we're really becoming a big food town, and at the time I started, um, 2007, it was a time when, like, Jose Garces and Mark Vetri only had one restaurant, Steven Starr had a handful, and I've really grown along with that. Um, for me, you know, working with chefs is a really, 
it's a cool experience because photography is such an individualistic thing and when I get a chance to c collaborate with another artist it's always something really special and um, you know I understand the value of getting work in a magazine um, even if it's a, whether the review is good or bad um, I feel a responsibility to make the food look amazing and I really try hard to always do that um, so um, it's just it's it's, it's really it's important to me you know? yeah so a picture still is worth a thousand words mm -hmm. absolutely absolutely you know the, the the value of getting a full page picture in a magazine is exponentially amazing yeah great that. You yeah know? Um, so whether the review is good or bad if the the food looks amazing you're probably still gonna get some dime or something. Um, and just being able to control that like I mm -hmm. said um, you know being able to supply images um, we're in a time when publishing is dying um, and magazines are sending out less photographers to shoot assignments and mm -hmm. are asking restaurants to supply images and yeah, if so you have an archive of images you can supply your your chances of getting better placement in a magazine are far greater and you can use them for your social media outlets and exactly. your web presence exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> the big thing in my world is you don't none of the publications have a budget anymore they need yeah. you to supply the photography so by getting good photography you control the image Absolutely. and you get more placements because you have good photography um, so Joe I have a question for you sure, sure. what are the current trends for restaurant websites is it necessary to have video a blog and what synergies do you think um, should be made with social platforms through in connection with the website sure. the restaurant website um, first and foremost I would say uh, maybe to, to kind of bridge the gap between the web design world and and the world that most of you all live in um, I think, and, and I could be way off, but I think that, that as restaurateurs, as chefs, um, that, that your goal is to have a vision and to express yourself in the work that you do, but you also take the guests into account. You're also kind of meeting them, and, and there's a hospitality element to this where you're kind of making sure that their needs are met at the same time, that there's an art to that. There's an art to remaining true to who you are and what you need to get across, but also mm -hmm. taking into account the people that are on the receiving end of this and what they need and what their wants are. That, that to me, is very similar to the way that we recommend that you're, you approach your, your kind of digital presence as well. You want to take your business requirements to heart, and you want to take your users' needs or your, your guests' needs to heart as well. So what I don't recommend you do is make the web presence a, a mirror reflection of your hopes and dreams as it comes to your restaurant or your dining experience. At the same time, I don't recommend that you hand the entire experience off to your users and only show the hours of operation and, and the things that they may be more interested in. I would say that the harmonious balance of those two things are, are critically important. Mm -hmm. I think uh, mobile has turned the corner. I think we've been mm -hmm. talking about mobile for years now. This is the first year where more traffic will hit websites from mobile devices than they do from desktop devices. Um, the purchasing of tablets is through the roof, especially with uh, baby boomers and people in kind of the, the 30 to 40 year age range and that's I would think uh, a majority of a lot of folks customers fall mm -hmm. into that category um, mm -hmm. so understanding the way to serve up the content that people need in mm -hmm. those kinds of experiences is really critical um, mm -hmm. the work that we did with Garces is focused on ensuring that if you were you know you had your iPhone out that if there was video it wasn't flash video that wouldn't play on an iPhone that it was formatted mm -hmm. properly um, and frankly, on a phone, video may not be the first thing you need. I mean, if you're on a phone, the first thing you may need is the location and the hours of operation and things that are critical while you're you know, leaving a show at the Tower Theater and deciding where you're going to have dinner. I mean, yeah. it's contextualized. Yeah. So understanding how your website falls into your guests' plans for the evening, how they make these decisions, should inform a lot of the way that you, you manage the content on your website. Mm -hmm. um, what do you love or hate when you load a restaurant's website for the first time? PDFs. The PDF menu doesn't Do open well. Hate I hate it. I hate a PDF menu. Sorry, <laughs> a PDF menu is <laughs> awful. Let's <laughs> clarify. You know, you can't. You can't yeah. I mean, what, what would you suggest on a mobile device for menus? Because a lot of times in the restaurant, when you need to send your yeah. menu to another person, it's yeah. always PDF. Yeah, that's fair. I think not everybody has the luxury of having a, a content management system that allows you to format your menu in HTML. I mean, that's. Yeah. The, the, the dream version of this is that you have um, all of this is in code so that as you if you have a really painless easy to use back end system that you're updating things in 
you can update the menu you know, within minutes. It's as simple as yeah. putting text in a field, and then that way it is coded and it is responsive and it is all of that. So sometimes a PDF isn't necessarily evil, but I think you do deal with a little bit level of frustration. I would only recommend that if you're going to use a PDF, work with someone that can design a PDF that's in columns that are easy to read on a phone screen that's that wide. Take that to heart and, and make sure that you're meeting people on that ground. Okay. Who's on the, uh, the technical end of what you're doing? Yeah. Uh, what sort of technology would you use to make an input form for a chef sure, sure. menu? And then also on the technology lines, what sort of technology do you use to, uh, you know, like programming language? Yeah, yeah. Would you use to um, tell the computer, you know, you're looking at this screen mm -hmm. and that screen? Yeah. So there's a lot of free open source tools that do this for you off the shelf. You don't have to know how to code. You probably have to work with someone to get this off the ground. You work with a developer or a designer to get this, you know, breathe life into this initially. But WordPress um, is a great way to go. It's a really low impact and it's free. It's, it's a great way to, to tackle something like this. Do you guys use WordPress? We use WordPress, yeah. We, use, we used a, a, a different CMS for the work we did with Garces called Expression Engine, which probably takes a little bit more heavy lifting to get set up. But now that it's set up, anyone really at Garces can update it. It's, it's designed to, to be, if you know how to write email, you know how to update the Garces website now. I mean, that, that's the way that it's, it's designed on the back end. But a tool like WordPress can get that done just as easily as a more robust tool like Expression Engine. Yeah, sorry. When designing your website or hiring someone to design your website, mm -hmm. are we, like, should we look to someone who's going to update it for you or someone who's going to create it yeah. and teach you how to easily do it yourself? I would say the latter. I would, I would go for a, a site that you can maintain yourself. I don't, pay like a one -time fee. Yeah, I don't think you want to lease your website from somebody. I think you want to buy it. You want to pay for it, have it delivered, and then you want to be trained in the course of this work to manage and update it as needed. Now, two years down the road, you're going to need to like evolve this. You're going to have a big redesign. You're going to want to move it around meaningfully. Then you probably hire somebody to come back in and maybe help you to redesign your site. But in the day-to-day -day care, and, care and feeding of your site, you probably want a resource that you can reach out to in an emergency that's on the other yeah. end of a red bat phone, the site's down, I need help, the server, whatever. Right. Like you probably need that in some kind of relationship and that's probably a service that a lot of developers would offer just as a kind of, you know, when needed kind of service. But I think, yeah, whenever possible, you want to be taught to fish, not be given a lot of fish mm -hmm. because you need to be able to make these changes when you think it's meaningful. If you're being timely about the content you're putting out there and you want to respond to a change in the menu daily or you want to change, you want to respond to events that are happening. Right. You need to have the keys to your own presence to be able to, to update it that way. Which means you should bring someone in on your organization from the beginning to work alongside you to get it done because you may not be able to do it all yourself. Yeah, I think the other thing I would mention too is um, you know, OpenTable obviously is a really powerful tool that, that a lot of folks use. One of the goals in our work with Garces was to still use OpenTable effectively, but to shift the dynamics so that diners were not going to OpenTable to book a reservation at a Garces restaurant. Diners were going to the Gar Garces restaurants and then using the OpenTable widget there to book those reservations because they pay you save money. dramatically less. If, you, if they book through your website, you're paying less per reservation than if you book through OpenTable. And what we saw when we redesigned it, um, it used to be when you Googled Distrito Philadelphia, the first search result would be the open table link, and then there would be the Garces actual website. Um, just in the course of the redesign, without doing anything really spectacular, the Google results have flipped because Google searches for things in very peculiar ways. Um, and, and we're aware of that. So now the first thing you see when you go there is the Distrito site from Garces, open tables too, but that's all the difference in the world in terms of you know a dollar here, a dollar there per diner. That, that adds up really, really quickly over the course of a year. That's great. Okay, one more, and then we'll go to Mary. No, this guy. For, um, for restaurants that are smaller and don't have the budget of a mm -hmm. Jose Garces, um, a lot of them are looking to yeah. Facebook as now as their online presence, mm -hmm. and they're not understanding what the value of having their own website is. So I'm just curious, you know, sure. if you can quickly give me an idea of your take on yeah. the, having Facebook as your online presence versus wow. an old website, because mm -hmm. a lot of these people can't mm -hmm. afford wow. to redo their website. That's, that's a fair question. I think Facebook is a good stopgap if you have no other alternative. If you have a really antiquated website and you need desperately something new, Facebook's an option. I would say that Facebook's incredibly dangerous. I think they, you don't own the rights to the way that your content's presented. Facebook changes their rules on a weekly basis, mm -hmm. if not mm -hmm. daily basis. So you're, you're really handing a lot of keys over to someone that, that has the control and you don't, and you're losing out on 
a tremendous amount of differentiation when you do that too. You know, you're basically deciding like, I'm going to jam my website, my, my restaurant into a template that looks like everybody else's template that's out there. And really it's, it becomes a real crapshoot if they're going to care about your restaurant versus somebody else. I think covering your bases with Facebook in general is a great idea. Like you want to make sure you have that, that base covered in case someone does look at it that way. Mm -hmm. um, and again, like you said, if, if there's, you know, that's your only best option, then I think that's a valuable option. But I also think too, you know, there's nothing wrong with, with just walking across the street at Drexel and finding, you know, young designers and developers or reaching out to a school like Drexel and offering your restaurant's website redesign as a pro bono project for a class. I mean, they would kill for that. I just want to say with um, with having the ability to update your site and have the keys, like you said, to be to and learn and know and have the confidence to update your website um, with updated information and new information, that it really affects the the SEO of your site as well. Um, so one thing that I equate um, having a beautiful website, if you don't have um, someone, a point person, to be uh, actively putting new content up there. I, little Google, I, I envision them as little like Google robots <laughs> that just like crawl around and wait until they uh, find new information and then they <coughs> latch on to it. So if you have a beautiful website and you have invested in that, make sure that you, if you do have an ability to have a blog or to change events a lot, the same way where you judge a social media channel if they don't update their information, the same thing applies to your website. So it's important to make sure that you commit, just like a puppy, to if you have a website that is um, friendly to content and you have a space to, to share your voice, that you um, plan to make sure, put it on your calendar every two weeks at least to put new content there um, so that the SEO robots latch onto it and you have a reason to share through Facebook, through um, your different audiences, something new and interesting. So, Just, yeah. Oh, yeah, so, so a blog by its nature would give you higher yeah. uh, search engine options? Right, right. A and frequently updated blog. Right, yeah. more, yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. Unique content, too. You can't just, like, steal someone else's yeah. and put it up because Google hates that. They get angry. And it's then they the, put you on a bad list. In my head. I don't yeah. know. If no, that's no, right. I mean, I, that's absolutely correct. <laughs> and there's the underlying code behind that has something to do with it, too. Um, you know, we've used some of Jason's beautiful imagery in the Distrito site, and if that image that we serve up is not coded properly, it's just blank. It, there's a big gap, a hole in the middle of the website that Google doesn't see. Um, if you don't code, if you use Flash, Flash has been kind of the default easy way to create a website for, for many years now. It's going out of vogue because of Google. Google does not do, does this, this, the Google spiders don't scrape <laughs> Um, Spiders, code. that's what they are. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they, don't, they don't scrape that information out of a Flash website. So your, your site may as well be blank mm -hmm. as far as Google's SEO mm -hmm. is concerned. Now when you say so, you're not being coded properly, to, other than Flash, does that mean if you don't put like, the old tag in it or something exactly. like that? Then exactly, right. Angry at you. Yep. So let's exactly. talk about social media. One, one thing, I just Go wanted ahead. to mention, like, if you're thinking about putting together a website for your restaurant, a lot of times you're going to be putting together that content through a designer or a PR firm or you're going to reach out to a photographer, but it's really important to get all those ducks in a row at the same time mm -hmm. so that you're not, so a designer is not trying to wrench photos into a site mm -hmm. that right. doesn't That's necessarily so work, you know? Mm -hmm. That's a great um, point. It's like having a beautiful um, house built, and then you didn't think about how you're going right. to furnish it. Exactly. That's really by a bed that can't yeah. fit through the door. And it right. happens right. so often. Like same with you know, the copy. New mm -hmm. restaurants yeah. are need everything like that. So mm -hmm. a lot of times they just don't think to put everything together. And mm -hmm. my first call after I get, uh, you know, an assignment or a call from someone to shoot a website is like, who's the designer you're working with? Like, I need to talk to them about like mm -hmm. what pixel dimensions mm -hmm. they have in mind for their photos and stuff like that. And I always try and make those pictures have a lot of longevity mm -hmm. so that they can be used for social media and uh, press and PR and everything. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that one image will work cross mm -hmm. platform. So. We can come back to some questions. Um, I just want to make sure we cover some of the main topics. Um, for Mary, what platforms, what social media platforms do you think offer the most potential for restaurants? And we touched on Facebook just now, so, you know, I you could name them and talk about them. Yeah, I think... And, I'm sorry, also how to post on them. Fit Twitter to Facebook? That's like another two-hour session, I right? Know, I know, um, I know. I think that uh, I, I just want to go back to why are you doing, why are you doing social media? You know, um, really, it depends. Um, 
and also ask yourself why do you follow a page you know what what makes a one a website interesting to you as a consumer if you are the on the other end of things looking for a place to go um, why are you following certain pages on Facebook is it to see what keep tabs on what other people are doing or because you're interested in the posts that they're doing um, how many of you are on Instagram personally and professionally okay are they the same thing same accounts different accounts okay so like we all have these multiple identities that we have to juggle, right? And different accounts we have to log in on. Um, so I think one is what uh, to, to talk about why, to, which ones are the most effective. Um, you know, that's such a complicated answer because it's what are your resources? You know, what, how much time do you have? And um, how much photography that's do you have? How much, um, uh, how much do you, do you think it's important to link some of them together? Um, a lot of times we've, due to budget or time restrictions, we'll link uh, Facebook to our Twitter just so that we have something there. Um, and then you can go back and respond to some of the Twitter uh, comments. But it's such a unique thing. I mean, we all prefer, um, that's why there's a million restaurants in Philadelphia, right? Because we all have different um, tastes and preferences. So social media is the, the same mm -hmm. thing. Um, if you're more visual, Instagram, I think, is a, an easier one. And if you're feeling more artistic, I'm sure you've got a killer Instagram feed. Um, th and, uh, you know, people that have retail can sell through Instagram. Um, it, it's, uh, it inspires people. Facebook, I think... Um, can get a little cluttered, I think, with the changes they're making and they're trying to make so much money off of all of us and selling our information, that can be a, kind of a traffic jam. Um, oh. And Twitter is really, that is like the ultimate puppy, I think, of social media. You have to like, it's like being on an ongoing phone conversation mm -hmm. and really paying attention, and that can be exhausting. So how often do you post to each one of those? For myself or for clients, um, I clients. think that... Uh, Restaurants. I think you can, if you have a Facebook account professionally, you should post between one and two posts a day. That includes weekends. I'm sorry. Oh, this is just Facebook. This, this is, is just, just Facebook. Facebook. Um, so obviously, the other thing that we run into, you know, the chefs or um, management will come up, send us the special. You know, you're inspired with whatever ingredients you have, and you come up with this great idea before dinner service. But in order to tell the people out there about it, you almost have to know about it two hours before because people that customers are trying to think where they're going to go for dinner. So um, spe it affects everything. You know, if you can be inspired a little bit sooner, that would be helpful <laughs> for social media. Um, and if you know your weekend specials, drink specials, those are ones that can maybe come together a little bit faster. And if you can get a photo, which so tells uh, That was my question. It. So what about the photo if Jason's not around? Um, well, there are, uh, you can Google uh, how to take a great iPhone photo. Uh, Jason. <laughs> I mean, put your food next to a window. It's the easiest like, yeah. solution, you know? No one wants to see like the, the ugly fluorescence in the kitchen, you know? Or the dish or, towel. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The and I mean, yeah. right. Yeah, sure. Right. It's beautiful. Earlier you mentioned that you know, when you have a good photo, we have to send them down to the magazines. Yeah. But let's say if we as a restaurant wanted to get on the magazine a good spot, do we call you to take the photo and then you call the magazine? No, you call me. <laughs> that's where I fit in. <laughs> yeah, usually there's a PR marketing We contact the, the yeah, we contact all of the media, which is now social, uh, is every possible media on the internet, um, magazines, print, newspapers, radio, television. Anytime we need photography, we would contact a photographer, often Jason, and get a photo shoot done before we start the whole process, if possible. But there are times when an editor is in town or they have a family member and they're eating at your restaurant and they've had an awesome meal and they go back and they want to do a little story or include you in some kind of a roundup. And you might get a call from, from a yes. magazine saying, do you have a great shot? Yeah. And that's when you put your phone, iPhone off camera and you call a photographer. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, don't send that, right, to do exactly. Some wide image, you know? Um, yeah, yeah, keep that for social media. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Social media is more forgiving about mm -hmm. the quality. Except of if the you're Martha Stewart, which we've all seen her oh, terrible yeah. errors. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> well, it's more forgiving because it moves so much faster. Yeah. It's not sitting in your home, and you're not passing it on yeah, to yeah. a friend. I think you have even more license when it comes to Instagram video, too, even than Instagram mm -hmm. photos, sure, because sure. it's intended to be, you know, kind of personal and gorilla. You're not, mm -hmm. there's yeah. not a high expectation of quality in Instagram mm -hmm. video. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Vine, too, for that matter. I also encourage, uh, I'm, I'm still in the restaurant business, mm -hmm. but not in media. We've got about 40,000 people on our social media account. Mm -hmm. We empower other people in our organization by project on who to go after. So you got a bartender, you got a chef, you got somebody who's really interested in social media, give them power to do yeah. Well, opinion. there's there's mm -hmm. some red, that's a, a good resource um, to do. There are some red flags. I mean, if somebody, if you need to fire them and they have your uh, login information and they've been managing your account, uh, we've seen, yeah, well, right, but we've seen, right. We've seen, um, I have seen people through social media who uh, they were working at one establishment and went to their competitor and then were able to sabotage the other location through social media. So mm -hmm. that's, that's a great resource, but just, you know, careful. Cover, cover your butt. Well, you mentioned videos, and I'm curious, um, what do all of you think about videos, Vine, Instagram, or sort of what we would call long form, which would be about two minutes? I love that stuff off your website. I love that stuff in those channels. I, I love yeah. the use of that kind of communication. Sure, sure. I think, you know, if I'm at work and I'm trying to figure out where my wife and I are going to go to dinner that night, the last thing I want is a, is a video to automatically play and start playing music at my desktop and kind mm -hmm. of, you know, ambush me like that. <laughs> right. What about on a website a video that I could choose to, re to view? I, I think that's, there, that's okay. I still think that there's... There's probably content that's a higher priority than mm -hmm. than a video would be. I'm not saying it's it's not. No, but videos but are hot stuff right now, so it's interesting to hear the your opinion. The video is a big, yeah. right. big thing too. I mean, how much time do we have? Like realistically, no it. one's yeah. gonna like you know we're used to watching Instagram videos yeah. that are five seconds yeah. or whatever, and yeah. I mean, no one's gonna sit for longer than a minute for sure. Yeah. You know, thirty mm -hmm. seconds to a minute if you can tell your story that quickly. I mean, you can definitely. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think that question just goes back to like you, you're consumers too. You know, like wh how much time do you have to watch a video? Do you do you want to watch a video? And if mm -hmm. so, how long would it be? And then and make sure plan if you accordingly. Have, mm -hmm. If there's something interesting that you're saying through the video, or something important that you're communicating through video, make sure it's through something that's not video as well as an alternative. Right. You don't want to put all your eggs in one basket and if someone chooses not to watch the video, they don't get any of that message. So sure. if, you, if it's about you and your restaurant, make sure it's in written form somewhere else as well. So that way if they are not into watching a video at the time, that the content's not lost on them. The only exception would be if you're doing some sort of contest or promotion and all, all channels, Facebook, online, um, everything says, watch the video to find out how to enter to uh, win. You can yeah. call action to watching the video where you have yeah. this golden nugget of information or something. Yeah. That would be the one exception. That hierarchy of, of content is really important. Yeah. Like, There's a lot of cookbooks that are doing video trailers and uh, restaurants that do video trailers before they come out. So these are like teasers and, mm -hmm. and uh, just something to like get people interested. And But once that that other information is there, I don't know if, how, how valuable those videos Continue to be. Uh, I think one other uh, way that videos are engaging and interesting to consumers and viewers is if it's a how-to, like a really quick how-to. Sure. You know, um, a lot of chefs are doing that to engage with their customers. Mm -hmm. And if, if you wouldn't have FaceTime with them, but you can do this little quick video of, hey, here's how I prepare a quick whatever, that would be an, an example of a That good was my video. question for Jason again. So I'm a chef and I want to shoot a video. What yeah. do I do? Yeah. Sorry. I, mean, I think I think those kind of how-tos are kind of cool. Um, uh -huh. You know, if there's a way you can convey your message as a chef personally, like, you know, like we just saw a panel on Farm to Table, and, and I've talked to Josh Lawler about going out and shooting him at a farm and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. You know, certain there's certain ways you can sort of hit your concept home through mm -hmm. video and photography that are really important. Mm -hmm. And not to reveal any secrets, but if you were going to go shoot Josh at a farm, would you be shooting for that long version, short version, it's lots of short, versions? You know, it's. I mean, I think I think short attention span is, is mm -hmm. really important. You mm -hmm. know? So fifteen seconds. Yeah, fifteen thirty seconds. You know, mm -hmm. I think is, is is enough to tell a story. And mm -hmm. We're so used to looking at images, mm -hmm. just as you know, everyday audience mm -hmm. people, and like, you know, the the time in which you can process mm -hmm. an image is really mm -hmm. quick and in 15 seconds mm. you can show 
a lot. 20 frames. And uh -huh. That could be really interesting. A, an interesting story. Well, then I would take it back to Mary and say, you were going to tell us how often we should post. Well, then how often should we be posting videos? How, how, okay. Once, twice a day on Facebook. We didn't talk about Instagram or Twitter. Well, you said all the time. I would time. do one a day, at least on Instagram and Twitter, um, and one and one to two Facebook. Um, as far as your and then web web content. I mean, and, and let's define content. I mean, that's that's it, a photo gallery, a couple of images with a, a couple of captions. I mean, that you don't need to write this full blog post. Of, if you read BuzzFeed, you you know that a picture with a caption. We're we're addicted to that as a society. So. Um, content can be photography, video, or blog post, or uh, heavy photo captions. Um, and so those are reasons that you can share with the audience. Also, content can also be upcoming events and um, uh, new menu items if it's coded properly and you can share it. Okay, you guys have the floor again. I didn't mean to go so far I down that. I was going to say, um, uh, I find, because, you know, I'm sure we're all on these Facebook and Twitter and everything all day long and there's so much we're inundated all day long with different images and copy I think everything has to be like so succinct and like a picture and a caption and that's it and hopefully as they're scrolling up and down the you page hope. that image and that caption is going to grab them otherwise they're on to the next mm -hmm. thing and that's why I was surprised to hear about the video I think everybody's attention span is just so short to have somebody stop Something's going to have to grab them to make them stop and then want to click and watch that right. 15 or 30 second video. Did you have a question? Yeah, I was wondering more, like a lot of the stuff you guys are talking about, uh, it sounds great in concept, but somebody, the last panel I was in in this room was about BYOBs and how pretty much each chef is a one-man army for every single restaurant. Now, mm -hmm. if that guy is supposed to be doing two things on Facebook and a thing on Instagram, mm -hmm. blah, 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 mm -hmm. right. who also doesn't have the banking to hire you guys to help out, mm -hmm. right. where's the middle? You mm -hmm. know, like, where, where does everybody benefit online, but it's still, you know, a small operation where everything's done in the Sure. Mm -hmm. I think for, from a social media, are you asking specifically sure. about social media? I think that's where you just have to go back again. Why are you doing it? You know, um, is it to have a presence? Is it to engage? Um, a lot of times, if the brand has already been established, then it's really about engaging with them and sharing with them. Um, and then setting realistic expectations um, and measuring your resources. So if you can only have one opportunity to, you know, if you can self train to post regularly as part of your day-to-day -day operations in general. Um, that's probably going to be the best um, way to be successful with social media and just pick one and then drive your use your website to drive to that social media outlet and use your um, business cards, you know, all your other collateral to drive to that one and don't, don't feel like you have to do all of these social media outlets f like why? Who says yeah, you have to? I, I agree with that entirely. I think um, people can sniff out authenticity really quickly. And if your heart's not in it, then, mm -hmm. you know, bored tweeting or, or unengaged tweeting and sharing is almost as bad or worse than not doing it at all. Yeah. So, be, you know, whatever your real. passion, you know, it could be just, here's what we got from our supplier today, or here's, you know, it's simple. It doesn't have to be earth shattering updates. But again, you know, if, if if your heart's not in it or you don't have the time for it, then that, that kind of shows through as well. There are tools though, um, I would recommend something like TweetDeck yep. that you can use to you can pre-schedule and you can pre you can manage things across several channels. You can post it to you know several places at once. Um, it's free. It's very very intuitive. You just hook it up to your social account. You log in through there. You can connect Facebook and Twitter to it. So it's mm -hmm. it's an easier way to to take two steps with one step than having to to you know yeah, it's, live and die by a, a schedule. It's, it's like that. social media. So like that's the same as socializing in our personal lives. You know, you can say yes to every single dinner party you get invited to or activity, or you can be realistic and be like, here's what I can actually commit to and what I know I can do well. So people will respect those boundaries. Mm -hmm. Your followers can get used to you posting at the same time every day sure. too, mm -hmm. which Absolutely. is a nice touch. Um, but I also think there's some inexpensive ways that you can do things too and still manage them yourselves or, in or hire professionals like on short-term basis. And I think that um, professionals, for lack of a better term, have become more open to working on smaller accounts and in smaller time frames. So um, something we've been doing a lot lately is quick shoots that include f photos and videos and turning them back over to the client to use as they will. Or we might use them with them 
depends on what it is. So who owns the rights to the, the photos? Well, that's negotiated with the photographer. Um, and uh, Jason, actually, you have a nice comment on that, which is a very important one. I typically you, retain the rights to all the pictures I make. However, I, I grant you a license to use, um, and as you see fit. Like, for me, I, I like you to get the most bang for your buck, and mm. I, I think you should be able to use your pictures for your own promotion, for press requests, and cross-platform social media-wise. Now, within that, you owning the rights, does that mean if you came and you shot our food, could you use that photo and relabel it as somebody else's product? No, no, I would never do that. Like, you know, I, I wouldn't shoot... Legal. uh, legally. Legally, no. I probably could, but yeah. I wouldn't. I mean, I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't, you know, I can't shoot uh, spaghetti right. at a mice and sell it to Berea. Right. But honestly, you could add that you know. to your contract. He'd but, probably yeah, agree to that. Yeah, um, and I mean... Um, we have time for two more questions. Okay. Sorry. Be careful with stealing photos, too. I mean, not yeah. stealing, but, like, if you're going to repurpose, always give credit because people will appreciate it. Even if it's a guest in the restaurant and they took a picture, if you choose to repost it through your social media stream, say, give a credit to who took that picture, and they will reward you with yes. loyalty, and re and it, it, just don't, don't forget to credit. Questions? Oh. <laughs> okay. What is a ballpark range that. for a well-designed website from scratch? Well, I mean, for like no pressure. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> what's your budget? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would say <laughs> the it's incre it's totally flexible. I would say that you know our projects tend to be in the six figure range, but that's you know one end of the spectrum. I think you can easily get someone that can do something like this for you know five figures or for four figures or four. I mean, it just depends. Um, it depends on the. The person you're hiring and what their capabilities are it depends on where they are in their career. If you're hiring an individual versus hiring an agency, what kind of services they're going to provide. I would say though that if you're looking to, if you're looking to design and launch a professional website, I think you know you should be you should be prepared to spend thousands of dollars, not hundreds of dollars, at a minimum. Um, and if you're looking to hire somebody, you know, free or pro bono or, or on the fly, one to one, you're going to get what you pay for. I would recommend if you're looking to, to do this in a smart way and save money, I would definitely take my advice and partner with a school that has a digital program, work with students, work with their young alumni, um, find a way to connect with them and have it facilitated through the school, and you'll get actually, you know, a quality output that you're hoping for rather than, you know, you're the first person someone's going to start to ignore if you're not paying them a lot. Um, so I think it, it's really, it can vary wildly what you're going to pay for something like this. But a good website can mean all the difference for your business, too. Mm -hmm. So it's Absolutely. a good way to spend your money. Yeah, I think um, without a good website, you're invisible. Go ahead. Um, I did not hear any mention of Pinterest or Google+. Plus. We didn't get there. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, um, that's okay. I know. I was curious about your thoughts. That's why I was trying to I think back. Pinterest is, uh, there's a certain uh, demographic who's interested in using Pinterest. How many people here pin have a Pinterest page? Okay, and is it personal? Okay, so personally, what you do both? I do both. Um, I think it's really just, you know, again, the reasoning is, is it to share information to stay competitive or is it to engage and drive traffic to either your website or to your restaurant? Um, because I don't know if Pinterest would necessarily bring people in as quickly as uh, an effective Facebook or, or social media, uh, uh, other social media campaign. But it does keep you competitive and engaged um, with your, your audience. Mm -hmm. And that's for restaurants, for cookbooks, it's entirely different. It's yeah. A great way for a cookbook author to build their yeah, Google I, Plus. Yeah, I, I don't even want to spend any time on Google Plus. Then <laughs> okay. not because, worth your time. Yeah. There's a lot of conversation just in the food blogger world right now. <laughs> mm -hmm. Food blogger world. Because right. Because Facebook is screwing everybody massively. There could everybody. be, yeah, there could be, um, I think currently that's not something that needs to be heavily invested in, but that could change in, in six months. It would have to be like a, a, an amazing turn of events for people to start yeah. to flee Facebook and yeah. really adopt Google Plus. Yeah. It had its chance and it didn't do it, I don't think. How do you guys feel about Yelp? So another question I had oh, to Yelp. ask, I didn't get there. Well, Yelp, yeah. um, I think the okay, so consumers love it because they love to, to judge from behind a computer, right? And <laughs> be kind of tough, not tough, very tough. Um, I think that, uh, if you want to talk about this, 
no, nobody mm. wants to really talk about Yelp because <laughs> yeah, it's just going to make everyone feel sick in their stomach, and we don't want. <laughs> you can have a drink. There's a lot we can all drink. So, sorry. We, we travel a lot. We were out with, with some guys from Manhattan, and they're like, "Let's look at Yelp. Let's see what's, whatever's on Yelp is viral." I'm like. I know the thing is well so on the on the online publication that that I run in addition to the content management we have a comment section where people can leave reviews and so that um, it's great because a lot of people want to engage and people want to say what they think you know when when you eat a good meal or have a bad experience we're programmed to want to tell people about that um, so it's a great outlet for for people I think the best way to manage Yelp as the restaurateur is to get on there yourself say hi thank you for visiting us um, sorry that your expectations weren't up to par uh, uh, you know we didn't exceed your expectations and comment to it and and show that you're engaged if you hide it's gonna yeah. do more damage than if you say hey you know it'll make them look like the a-hole versus you. There's always neg. I totally agree. I totally agree. I think there's mm -hmm. always negative reviews. Do you want to be reviews. friends? No, should hang really, out. It's, no. it's, it's, there's always... <laughs> and I, when I, anyone that uses Yelp really knows that there's a point. knucklehead yeah, component here that's just going to, to complain. But even if, you know, all you do is is exhibit that that person's been heard, then mm -hmm. I almost discount those negative mm -hmm. reviews yep. because it just, it throws well, you. I mean, uh, we have to talk a lot of restaurateurs off the ledge on that, yeah. on Yelp. Mm -hmm. And quite we honestly, so hard, if you can read between it, like you're saying, you can see that the restaurant's pretty good overall. And it does tell you something if you're traveling and right. can help. Don't, don't be rude in your response though, because if right. you're heated, like take a minute and like maybe call a friend, <laughs> you know, and then come back mm -hmm. to it and just very calmly address it and say say something like, if you come in, um, ask for me by name or for my general manager and I'd be happy to give you, you know, another experience. Please let me know next time you're in. I mean, you couldn't have a better response to a negative mm -hmm. review than that. Mm -hmm. That's the how you use Yelp to your advantage, I think. And that's a really good indicator for why having, I think, a strong web presence of your own is so important right. because you don't want... Yelp to be the thing that shows up when someone sure. Googles you. Yes. Good point. Because you can't control yeah. it, right. and there is going to always won't. be that kind of slime. Right. There. Right. So, do you find that the integrity of the users of sites like that has changed since it, since they've come out? Yeah. And yeah. I always thought conventional wisdom was just to stay away from those sites and do the best you can do, and you know. The people who come in and talk to you are the people that you pay attention to. Uh, well, it, so the people writing, the integrity of the person writing it is probably not very good. Their moral compass is so off that they feel that instead of having a face-to-face -face discussion with whoever brought their check and, and said what their issue was to your face so you could correct it then, they feel the need to go home and then write a nasty review online. So, um, so <laughs> it, it doesn't matter how many people t you interact with face-to-face. -face. It's, it's really just taking the communication to the next level because the next diner who has not met you or... At, eaten at your restaurant or n knows anything about you is going to research you and judge you before they even walk through your door. So it's good if you can stop yeah. that before they yeah, come the in. The value of that interaction has like increased over time, like the actual response. Of it. Yeah, I think it's about reputation management, and it's just making sure that you're, you know, dotting your eyes and crossing your t's, and, and you're you're. Not defending your territory, but you're mindful of what's going yeah, on. Yeah, don't there. be defensive. Just yeah. be like, "Yo, I'm here. I see that, and like, just yeah. come back and visit us and stuff." You can't ignore. It. I mean, that's to your point. <laughs> you know, this is if this is the first line of defense where people make a decision, a snap decision about whether to, to visit your restaurant or not. Then, mm -hmm. you, know, you I don't think you can turn a blind eye to it. I don't think it's right. and and you know the reviews there are the same as like comments on YouTube videos. I mean, yeah, it's, it's just ridiculous. The, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it, there. There is a there is a pervasive kind of reflex that that tools like this allow to to, to be shared with other people so you have to just know what you're dealing with when you get into the the guts of something like that most people once they get used to being reviewed that way will say that they can use it if for patterns if they see a pattern mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. then maybe they do have a problem with somebody yeah. at the front door or yeah. or it's a yeah. former a employer or who something. who want uh, employee sorry who mm -hmm. versus wants to yeah. mm -hmm. right because a lot of people come up with fake names mm -hmm. one thing with with um, comments how many people here use open table okay open table as um, a restaurant okay so so the the reviews on open table are um, 
are are tested like you have to have you have to be registered you have to be a diner you had to have eaten at that restaurant in order to leave a review um, so those are the ones that you should take very seriously if you are uh, oh, the one person in the back who is um, versus Yelp because some those people there's no criteria they may not have even eaten at your restaurant they could just be cousins of someone you fired and want to mm -hmm. be jerks mm -hmm. so it's <laughs> awesome <laughs> so I realized we could have had three separate sessions here, which was why I tried to keep it moving a little bit. I hope that was helpful, and I hope you enjoyed it. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. All right.